Welcome back to Respect the Dead, the podcast where we don't. Betty, it's no surprise that everyone celebrated your demise. And now, worms are eating your eyes. So don't you worry your rotting head as you sleep in your sodden bed. It's time to respect I love this song the so dead. much. I love how someone was like, what's that song? I'm like, it's obviously. Yeah, they were like, I- I'm trying to find it on Spotify. I love that. <laughs> it was amazing. I was like, oh, honey, no, it's not. We should put it on Spotify. Yeah, we should. Someday. Right. Someday we'll add more verses. I, sh- I can put it on Spotify. I, I can play triangle in the back, like a little ding to help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I could, I could Morocco. Ooh. A little Morocco. Oh, yes. A little Morocco, a little yeah. triangle action. Yeah. Cute. All right. So uh, right off the bat, sending an image. Oh, okay. Starting with an image. Uh, also, welcome back. <laughs> oh, yeah. Welcome back. I'm Hoots. <laughs> and I'm Mandy. I'm Kaylin. All right. This image is just to, like, set the scene. Okay. We're, we're beginning. Not them trying to charge me $575 Canadian for No! It. <laughs> They are not. Oh, oh, it's yeah. to buy it. It's to buy it. You don't have to buy it. Okay, good. Fuck That's... that shit. Yeah, it's four hundred and ninety nine dollars. <laughs> U- United States dollars. So we're starting at the end. In January of nineteen seventy one, France's first lady of fashion, Gabrielle Coco Chanel, passed away in the Hotel Ritz, where she had lived for over thirty years. Her funeral was held at Paris's. Eglise de la Madeleine. The first row of seats at her funeral ceremony was filled with fashion models and her coffin was overflowing with white flowers. Her funeral was attended by elite celebrities and cultural icons of the day, such as Salvador Dali, Yves Saint Laurent, and Marie-Hélène de Rothschild. The actual First Lady of France, Claude Jacqueline Pompidou, organized a national tribute to Chanel, an official exhibit in Paris celebrating Chanel's life and work. It was planned to open in October 1972. Shortly before the exhibit's launch, French magazines and newspapers announced that Chanel's homage would likely be canceled, or at the very least postponed. As journalist, former French resistance fighter, and husband of Olivia de Havilland, Pierre Gallant, was preparing to expose French counterintelligence documents dating back to the Second World War that confirmed Chanel's affair with a Nazi spy named Baron Hans Gunther von (laughs) Dinklager and her work as a... (laughs) It's a good name. Baron Hans Gunther von Dinklager. I am so sorry. And her own work as an agent for the op. It's a very funny name. Also, at some point... At some point, I am going to slip and say Dinklage because it's pronounced Dinklaga, but it's definitely spelled like Dinklage, like, Dinkli- like Peter, Peter Dinklage. Dinklage. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Peter Dinklage probably pronounces his name Dinklage because he might be related to a Nazi. I oh, don't no. know. <laughs> I could just be like, I could be slandering Peter Dinklage on this episode, <laughs> but he has the same name as this Nazi spy. So the paper, uh, the paper's also um, exposed Chanel's work as an agent for the Obwehr, Germany's military intelligence service, during the war years. The homage to Chanel was ultimately scrapped, but the Chanel brand and the woman behind it have remained fairly untarnished by Coco's Nazi past. But today, things might get just just a little tarnished, because we are digging up and dragging out the oh-so-elegant corpse of a Coco Chanel. I'm so fucking excited. (laughs) <laughs> Me too. And also, I have a personal vendetta Ooh. against her. What you do? What's your personal vendetta? Okay, so I really wanted my my like logo, my branding, because Kaylin Conrad to be two C's intertwined. But that's the fucking Chanel logo. That's the best <laughs> way to do it. So I'm like, it's probably not as bad as the Nazi stuff. <laughs> but, like, but still, it's up there. It's definitely how up there. Dare she? <laughs> Bitch. I think you should still. I think you should still do it. Try to get away with it until you get a season to six. <laughs> I mean, she won't. <laughs> so I just I dropped another picture in the chat. Oh because, wow! Um, yeah. she is beautiful. She really is. Got like what a what an iconic look. I hate her. She like literally looks <laughs> like contrapoints. 
<laughs> she looks so much like ContraPoints in this picture. Or like rather like ContraPoints has been trying to look like Nazi collaborator. Gabrielle Chanel. <laughs> Gabrielle yeah. Chanel. Th- that's, what I th- that's what I feel like I look like when I'm smoking mm. a joint in my apartment I'm, late at night. Like yeah. this is the look I'm, I'm, I'm in my head that I hope I look like, even though yeah. I definitely don't. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's, that's also what I feel like I look like, but I probably look like, like a, like a hairy Cheeto. <laughs> just like that like shape of just like the like the like almost a C of just like laying in bed looking at your phone yeah <laughs> smoking yeah. the last joint just sitting there yeah I'm just like a sprawled like cow in the middle of my my room just yeah twitching occasionally <laughs> like Not cow. I'm a I'm cheeto a- you're <laughs> a cow and we were talking about who's having pig skin or- <laughs> pig skin a flat head and a fat ass we're like <laughs> We're all like, we're such haters, but we're like so yeah. okay with it. We're a good group. Uh, we've got, some, we probably need therapy. I'm in therapy. Gabrielle Von Hoor Chanel was born in 1883 in Samoa. Did you say Von Hoor? Von Hoor. B O N H E U R. Oh. I'm like I, okay, I hate her, but I'm so obsessed. <laughs> Gabrielle von Hor Chanel. I'm like like Peter Drinkwater or whatever his name was. Drinklager. <laughs> Drinklager. Okay, so <laughs> Gabrielle von Hur Chanel was born in 1883 in Somer, Monet Loire, to a laundry woman named Jean and a street vendor named Albert. She was born in a charity hospital, and Gabrielle's name was misspelled Chasnel on her birth certificate, as neither her, of her parents were present for the registration of her birth because they both had to work. And it would remain. So, is that misspelled, or like, is that just a whole different name? It's possibly misspelled. Like, there's there's conflicting reports about whether it was um, accidentally misspelled or if it was an older spelling of the name that was changed when she oh, was still okay. a child. Um, but it's okay. Chasnel, uh, C-H-A-S-N-E-L. And it would remain that for the rest of her life on her birth certificate because getting it legally changed would mean she'd have to go down to the registrars and acknowledge that that was her birth certificate yeah. and she was born in a poor person's hospital. <laughs> She's like, mm, yeah. no, I'll just, I'll just like uh, so go she around. Would, yeah. name, like, she was stubborn. <laughs> Named Chesnel. <laughs> That's fine. You could just call me Bechamel. It's everybody okay. everybody yeah. knows. <laughs> uh, so she grew up one of six children and she was incredibly impoverished. Uh, she and her siblings did not even attend school for the first decade or so of her life. When Gabrielle was 11, her mother, Jean, died at the age of 32, and her father sent her brothers to work off as farm laborers, and her and her sisters were sent off to live in a convent orphanage where they would remain until they were sent off to a Catholic boarding school in their teens. So she didn't didn't even go to school until she was a teenager. Um, She she grew up impoverished and then uh, lived in a a convent orphanage as a preteen. The Catholic church at the time was highly anti-Semitic, surprise, surprise, especially in France. There was a relatively recent political scandal, uh, the Dreyfus Affair, which uh, centered the 1894 arrest, trial, and conviction of a French artillery officer of Alsatian Jewish, Jewish descent named Captain Alfred Dreyfus for high treason based on false evidence. And the scandal basically split the, the entire country into two camps, pro-Republican anti-clerical Dreyfusards, as they were called, and pro-army, mostly Catholic anti-Dreyfusards. So Basically, because of this political scandal, if you were French and Catholic in the last decade of the 19th century, you just like had a major axe to grind with all Jewish people because of this one event. In addition to the like already present anti-Semitism within the Catholic Church. Right. That's what that already was there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like all the other things they believe about yeah. Jewish people. As yeah. anti-Semitic as Catholics already are, add in that like extra axe to grind if you were French at this time. So so a lot of her biographers believe that like this was kind of like the genesis of her later anti-Semitism. Um, she was kind of brought up in it. According to Coco Chanel biographer Hal Vaughn, Chanel could not have escaped the Catholic Church propaganda the Catholic Church's propaganda campaign against the Jewish officer Dreyfus. And he wrote that later in life, Chanel's fear and hatred for Jews 
was noxious and notorious. At age 20, Gabrielle began working as a seamstress and as a singer at a cafe frequented by cavalry officers as her side hustle. It was here that she allegedly picked up her name, Coco, either from a song that she sang or as a shorthand version of cocotte, a French slang term for mistress or whore. So she did go by whore. (laughs) We we have to stand it. (laughs) We have to, like, we got to stand her for adopting the W slur as as a nickname. That is iconic. That that is pretty iconic. (laughs) (laughs) She was like, oh, you want to call me a little hoe? Well, I guess my name is Ho now. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) At 23, she became involved with with an ex-cavalry officer and textile heir named Etienne Balsan, living with him in his chateau Royal Lieu near Compagnie. I'm so sorry to French French people listening to this. Don't apologize to them. They know what they did. (laughs) Come. Compiègne, C O M P I E with an accent mark G N E. Compiègne. I'm not going to say it again. Sure. Uh, <laughs> with with Balsan, she lived a life of hunting, partying, and decadence, and he showered her with expensive jewels and gave her access to high society friends and contacts. Among them, British Captain Arthur Boy Capel, who would also become her lover. To quote Chanel years later, two gentlemen were out bidding for my hot little body. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, we we don't stand, but I do appreciate uh, someone who's like very aware that they're beautiful and willing to discuss all of the people that are fighting over them, like, especially at that time, like, okay, we can go off a little as a treat. Yeah. She, I mean, she's very sex positive. She's very, um, she's very confident at a time when women were not uh, outspoken or confident or certainly not sex positive. Yeah. This is like, this is the trouble with this subject is like, there is so much to admire And then there's so much later on that becomes so deeply reprehensible. Mm. Um, We contain multitudes. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) We sure do. (laughs) Uh, So while living with Balsan, uh, Chanel began began making hats, at first as a hobby, but then as a genuine career. She became a licensed milliner in 1910 and opened a boutique in Paris with the financial backing of her lovers called Chanel Modes. Ooh. Yeah. In 1912, a famed theater actress wore one of Chanel's hats in a play, and Chanel's millinery career blossomed. Ooh, and I've got another picture. Ooh, it's a yes. caricature from 1912 or 1913 of Chanel in her in her hat shop. I'm like, ooh, they had drawings <laughs> back then. Oh my god. <laughs> this is so that's a little that's a little caricature oh, of Chanel. Oh, 1919. So it's a little bit later on. They did not think she was as pretty as we did. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, like, like <laughs> people talked about her being very beautiful at the time, but this cartoonist uh, was not flattering to her. No, this looks like this is some no. olive oil from Popeye nonsense. Yes. She definitely looks like olive yes. oil. Yes. That's yeah. exactly who it looks like. The like, look neck. at that long ass mm-hmm. neck and that yeah. flat chin. That's yeah. exactly who she looks like. So, in 1913, <laughs> with Boy Capel's backing, Coco opened a boutique in Dovey. Deauville. Deauville. I'm so sorry, French people. Uh, <laughs> Deauville is a resort town where the couple often vacationed. At her boutique, Coco sold leisure and sports clothing for women. She was notable for using fabrics like jersey and tricot, which were mostly used at the time on men's underwear, and for encouraging women to discard their corsets and wear simplistic garments that allowed for more freedom of movement. Um, So this is like really what she's most famous for is, um, and it was like very radical at the time. She was like, why aren't why are we wearing all this shit like Mm -hmm. we should be comfortable we should be able to move um we should wear like humble fabrics like literally men's underwear fabrics Mm -hmm. like um that that allow us to like a lot of her um early designs were based on the sportswear of the time and she's like the very first person to have popularized wearing sports and leisure wear 
for fashion. Like, so in a way you could say there's like almost a direct line from like Coco Chanel to like Lululemon, you yeah. know? Interesting. Did she also have like juicy written written on the ass? <laughs> no, she was a little bit too classy for that, I would say. <laughs> As, as much as I was absolutely um, on board for Juicy Couture in 2004. You're like, I was a juicy girl. <laughs> like- a juicy girl. With this ass? <laughs> <laughs> so Coco Rick, Cro- 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 Croco. <laughs> That's what we're calling her now. Croco. Croco. Croco was kind of a fucking genius. Uh, she recruited her sister, Antoinette, and her aunt, Adrienne, who was a similar age to her, even though she was her aunt, to walk around the town of Deauville and, and the boardwalks wearing her clothing, modeling and telling oh, people where they purchased so their creations. Absolute girl boss <laughs> icon. I- amazing this is like the scene in a movie where they figure out some like viral marketing yeah opportunity and everything blows up i love it it's like a little montage of them like walking yeah. around and like yeah zooming in on like money and dollar bills it's signs. falling so yeah <laughs> it's a couple thing. <laughs> The zooming in on money as like money, like in hands and like handing a bag in re- in return. <laughs> like I'm so <laughs> I can picture it. People walking into the store. Yeah. yeah, there's like a little shot of the of the like two sisters and the aunt one night like throwing money in the yes. air and giggling because they've made so much. Yes. Okay. Um. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And the camera's on from below as the bag gets passed over. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only going to say this very quickly and then we're going to move on. But my original series that I made was not on YouTube. It was just music videos for my friends and I. And there was one that was exactly that. It was just like... <laughs> 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 to uh, Like a G6. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> horrible nice. song. They were all like moderately ironic, but like by the end of it, I was like, no, this is good. Actually. <laughs> That's awesome. Eventually, I like I, I will release them on my Patreon when I'm like, when I'm sure that people won't abandon me <laughs> when I have a safety cushion. I Do you want me them. to leave this in? Or yeah, edit leave it, it out. in. I'm <laughs> okay, okay, okay being embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the Deauville boutique was very successful and Chanel wished to recreate the success again in the wealthy French Basque town of Biarritz. Once again, with Boy Capel's financial backing. Like this, she was girl bossing it up, but like with, her lover's money. And I also respect that. I yeah, respect 100%. like being As like, is her right. Oh yeah. Yeah. She's like, oh, well, I'm I'm giving you the good good. So like why don't you put money down on my business? Yeah. <laughs> um, the Beeritz uh, shop was installed across from a casino and it performed so well among the wealthy Spanish tourists that after one year of operation in 1916, Chanel was actually able to repay Capel his initial investment in full. So, and I like, I don't know the details that they worked out. I don't know if um, Capel or, um, or Balsan ever wanted points on the back end or if it was literally just like, like yeah, I'm sleeping with you. I'll yeah. just give you money. <laughs> Pay me back. Um, I, I have no idea if they actually invested or just That's like... That's what I would like to assume. You know, put down money for her business. Yeah. Um, I kind of got the impression that they just put down money for her business because cause she was... I mean, her head game was that strong. Yeah, I was about to say, with that long neck. She had that long ass neck. <laughs> <laughs> the muscles in that neck. <laughs> she was just Nancy Reaganing like crazy <laughs> all over Europe. <laughs> As well she should. Coco and Jean. <laughs> so in Biarritz, uh, Coco also met and had a brief affair with Russian Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich. So you like I cannot emphasize enough how much you've got to respect this woman's game as far as like mm-hmm. men. <laughs> Coco, like she I I kind of said this in in a WhatsApp chat before we started recording, but like I had to cut out so many of her famous lovers because if I listed them all, it would just like read of a Wikipedia like a Wikipedia article of like everybody who was famous in Europe <laughs> in the teens and twenties. Like, right? Yeah, I remember you saying she that. was just. <laughs> Hooking up with royals, stars, yeah. like she was. In addition to being like very beautiful, like she had game. 
So Coco and Grand Duke Dimitri, uh, th- their affair was very short lived, but they would remain close friends for many years after the affair. And this is at the same time that she's still carrying on the affair with Boy Capel. Yeah, of course. <laughs> like she's just like of she's course, living her yeah. best life. <laughs> yeah. I would assume nothing else. <laughs> um, I think at this point, her um, her affair with um, uh, with the other guy with Balsan had already finished, but but just barely. By 1919, Chanel was registered as a couturier and established her Maison de Couture at 31 Rue Cambon, Paris, where it is still in operation today. Chanel's style was marked by simple, practical designs, including the original little black dress. <gasps> Ooh, I want to see it. And I'm going to drop That's a exciting. picture of the original little black dress in the chat. Chanel has, like, the company has released several versions of the little black dress, but the very first one is right there in Smithsonian. It's so cute. Oh, it is. It's so cute, it very right? It's, like, very simple. Yeah. It looks very flowy, too. Yeah, very simple, very comfortable. And that was, like, her entire deal was, like, let's be comfortable. Let's be simple. I know that she said that she was, like, making stuff out of underwear. I'm, like, I want underwear made out of whatever material mm-hmm. that was. It looks, like, so luxurious. Ugh, right? And that looks like it was made out of, like, silk, maybe. So, like, that was, like, a maybe a little bit less humble of a fabric, but still. Maybe satin. Yeah. It's shiny, so it's it's one of those. Chanel's designs were widely praised. However, not everyone was charmed by Chanel's masculinized wardrobe. A critic of the 19 in the 1920s wrote, "Women are no longer to exist. All that is left are the boys <laughs> created by Chanel." Oh my god. Oh my god. This not this... the erasure of women originally started yeah. with Coco fucking <laughs> Chanel. With Coco fucking Chanel. <laughs> it's oh like in the god. future there won't even be any women, they'll all be men. And I'm like, is this somebody talking about Coco? Let's play author talking about Coco Chanel or somebody in a gender critical Facebook group and then we'll just read our quotes and we'll have to figure out who you know. right <laughs> just the fucking panic of it like there won't be women anymore because they all dress like this and it's still like a very femme little dress yes. or like, certainly by today's standard that's still very femme concern like, as <laughs> old as time yeah if I if I wore that outside somebody would would yeah. like, kick my head in <laughs> like that is not that is not like a masculine <laughs> right thing for right. somebody to wear they would still accuse you of trying to erase women though so you know time is a black <laughs> oh, <circle. absolutely. laughs> erasing women by wearing one of the first dresses <laughs> ever for women you could only wear that if you have xx chromosomes what the <laughs> fabric will burn your skin <laughs> it would just it I, <laughs> it's like a vampire in sunlight. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like a fairy touching <laughs> iron. A, I mean, from the way that fucking it's, GC feminists there think it's copper. Unquote, talk about it. I mean, <laughs> like, they're not real, so I guess it doesn't matter. But I remember uh, getting a witchcraft book when I was a kid, and they're like, oh, put pennies on your window so fairies can't get in. And I'm like, and how am I getting out? Do you even think that you're sweet? <laughs> homophobic right (laughs) (laughs) chanel was also and i i kind of talked about this with mandy before we started recording but chanel was also the first person to popularize costume jewelry so despite the fact that she she'd been given millions of dollars worth of jewels by her wealthy and aristocratic lovers she found the idea of actually walking around wearing seven several million dollars worth of jewelry repulsive and she kept her jewels in a vault and one of the very first lines of Chanel costume jewelry were actually glass reproductions of the pieces given to her oh, by Balsam. Oh, that's clever. Oh, that's so yeah. weird. Yeah. I mean, this is This like... is getting problematic for me. I know, and I mean because like, I'm not finding it problematic yet. Yeah, I'm like oh. uh, yeah, right now I like her. Oh no, I'm so sorry. I do kind of like her right now. This is like, I mean, this is a point that was brought up in um, Hal Vaughn's um, biography of her, and this was a point that was brought up um, kind of very briefly in the anti-capitalist book of fashion that like conceded like. And in articles about her as well, like, that conceded that even though, um, I mean, she was still a designer who had no qualms with selling dresses to rich people for like the modern equivalent of like seven thousand um, dollars, but she very much encouraged like a um, conservative in in the 
in the, in the way that I mean, like less ostentatious yeah, yeah. style of dress that was like um, more um, simple and like in and austere um, and not like uh, very um, not flaunting wealth. And and she found it like repulsive that people would walk around wearing their wealth and jewels even though she had a vault full of jewels that right. she like she didn't turn them away she kept them right. which i can't say that i would either like if one of my lovers was like here's a million dollar like, oh, yeah, diamond yeah, necklace it, yeah i would also not pile yeah i would also not wear it but i, I think there's also like i think there's this the more wealthy you feel and the more like better than other people you feel i think the more likely you are as well to look at somebody who needs to display their wealth to like gain status. It's easier to like look down on them and be like, mm, like you're so rich and it's so tacky yeah. the way you display it. Unlike she was me. a snob. She was a total <laughs> snob her whole fucking yeah. Oh, of course she was. Yeah. What I'm saying is I stand even harder. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, I'm sorry, at least I'm not tacky enough to wear my jewels out. I just recreated an entire line of my jewels in fake glass and I keep mine in a vault that's, <laughs> that's guarded with by a beautiful man I'm having an affair with 24-7. <laughs> like, His name is Raul. <laughs> it's it's kind of iconic and I kind of stand. <laughs> I'm standing until um, I find out more. I'm like it, standing until, yeah, I, right, until I yeah. understand how I, I know, and horrible she we is. We know what <laughs> podcast we're on right now. So we yeah. all know where this is going to go. It gets really bad. <laughs> it gets really yeah. bad. But like her, her perspective is like she was a, a lifelong snob and she was incredibly wealthy for the majority of her life. But her foundational experiences, like as a child, like she grew up unbelievably mm. poor. Uh, I don't even think her mom knew how to read. Like, mm. unbelievably poor. Uh, so even when she started, when she s started dating, I guess for lack of a better word, Balsan, and living amongst the elite, like she was the one that was like trying to get them to like wear more simple clothes and stuff because she found it tacky and yeah. ostentatious and like and morally repugnant to to dress like you had well. Mm -hmm. And but she was happy to sell them dresses that were just ex as expensive as the dresses they were buying, except they were made to look like poor people's clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and that I kind of stand. To. She's the she's the original ripped jeans, <laughs> the she's purposeful like the... ripped jeans. I That's cost right, like ten thousand dollars. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And right now um, I'm wearing this striped shirt uh, in in reference to Coco Chanel because this like style of like sailor striped shirt uh, was popularized by her initially and like has not gone out of style since she made it like in, in fashion in like the 1920s. And she stole this look from like literal fishermen. Mm -hmm. She, she went down to, I think it was in Deauville, actually, um, which is like a seaside town. Like down just... at the docks with her like <laughs> pad and paper, her pad and pen. Yeah. And her rich boyfriend. She was like, what they're wearing is really cute. <laughs> so she literally like made millions dressing rich people to look like working class people. And I, I respect it. So three days before Christmas, 1919. Boy Capel died suddenly in a car accident. <gasps> Relating the incident to a friend many years later, Chanel would say, His death was a terrible blow to me. In losing Capel, I lost everything. What followed was not a life of happiness, I have to say. Also a blow to her was finding out that Capel had left money to her, his wife, and another mistress in his will. Oh, wow. Until that point, Chanel didn't know that there was another other woman, and she was terribly <laughs> hurt and humiliated by the revelation. Uh, Boy Capel was a bit of a bastard. She's like, I'm the only mistress <laughs> yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. Alleged, like, I could like, see how she wanted to square it that way, because allegedly, like, his, his marriage to his wife was, like, not very happy, but she was titled and moneyed and... So it was about the money. So she, yeah. I'm sure she convinced herself that like, well, he has to be married to her, but he loves me. Yeah. But he also loves someone else too. And just never told her. <laughs> uh, fuck boy. By this point, the once destitute Coco had navigated enough elite circles and established a successful enough string of businesses that she could stand on her own two feet in the Paris of the Roaring Twenties. 
Among her lifelong friends she'd meet at, at this time was Misia Sert, a Polish pianist, model, and habitual drug user. By the 1930s, Misia and Coco were injecting themselves with morphine daily, and the Jesus. habit would follow Coco Joke. for the rest of her life. Yeah. Oof. Literally, like, by uh, – by her 40s or 50s, like, she couldn't get to sleep at night unless she unless she stuck a needle in her arm. There's got to be less, like... Yeah, I, like... Less like, scarring ways to do this. Morphine? Or, like, I guess maybe don't... Maybe don't do morphine. I mean... Don't do, like... <laughs> she's doing heroin. Maybe smoke a joint. <laughs> like, yeah. Maybe some shrooms, miss. Uh, but, I didn't... Okay. Absent? <laughs> oh yeah, it's the 1920s, yeah, with honey. Some absinthe, like yeah. I guess absinthe has calories though, and I I think <laughs> right? Coco probably wanted to avoid eating. She was very thin. Oh, uh, I didn't put any of this in my notes, but just because it's fun, Coco Chanel also had like a like almost lifelong feud with Elsa Schiaparelli, uh, the the designer. Uh, so Elsa is like the opposite of Coco in every way. She was born aristocratic. And when she hit the Paris fashion scene in the 1920s, she like was working with the Dadaists and um, she was like making like cool, weird dresses, uh, like the dress that Warris Warfield Simpson wore when she announced that she was getting married to King Edward the Eighth was like this dress with like a giant lobster on it, <laughs> and so Elsa Elsa Schiaparelli designed that one, and um, they uh, so they they hated each other. Um, <laughs> they were they were opposites, like not just in aesthetic and and upbringing, but like they did not fucking get along. And Coco would only refer to Elsa as that Italian one, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and Schiaparelli would only refer to Coco as the hat maker <laughs> like a real hunt. <laughs> got her <laughs> fucking got her the hat oh my god i want a movie about their hatred oh i love it called the hat maker <laughs> yes and apparently <laughs> they were both at a party together uh shortly before the outbreak of world war ii so this would have been in the mid-30s and coco approached elsa and asked her to dance which was weird enough as it was uh and they danced together and coco led her uh coco was like leading like the man and coco led her over to a chandelier that was lit with candles and set her dress on fire (laughs) (laughs) oh my god yeah i just like again she's like the worst person but oh my god i bet she was so fun to be around like tell people the hat maker set your fucking dress on fire everybody who knew her at the time was like she was so charming but she was so like witty and sarcastic and mean and it's like oh my god she's (laughs) us no i was about to say she's just like me for real for real (laughs) i'm like this is like Minus the Nazi stuff, which is like minus a big minus. Minus the Nazi minus. stuff. It's, it's a, a very, big minus. It's a big one. She would have been one of those like mean girls on Twitter that we were like, oh my God, she followed me back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm so scared of her, but I also I'm love her I'm too scared so to much. reply, but I will like half of her tweets, not all of them, because I don't want her to think I'm a reply guy and unfollow. <laughs> <laughs> Just like the occasional one to seem cool. 1,000%. Yeah. yeah. In 1921, Chanel debuted her perfume, Chanel No. 5, to wild success. We all know Chanel No. 5. It's, it's a classic. In 1924... With department store owner Theophil Botters uh, eager to start selling bottles of Chanel No. 5, Coco entered an agreement with French businessmen Pierre and Paul Wertheimer to create Parfums Chanel. The Wertheimers agreed to provide full financing, marketing, and distribution for the product, and in exchange, they would receive 70% of eventual products. Uh, Botter would receive 20%. And Chanel would receive 10% just for the licensing of her name as she was planning on withdrawing from any actual business operations of Parfums Chanel. So it's just like a licensing fee for her name. But uh, she was later unhappy with the with this arrangement, calling Pierre Wertheimer the bandit who screwed me. <laughs> I like your French accent, Hoots. I think it's yeah, pretty too. good. 
Thank you. I'm trying. I'm trying. It's much more Parisian than like <laughs> I live in Canada. So my French accents here are like very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Quebecois. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like people walking around being like, wah. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a way to do it. <laughs> in my AIDS video, I pronounced Quebecois, Quebecois once or something like or Quebecois. Uh and on purpose? No, on accident. And I never fucking heard the end of it. <laughs> like every Canadian, everybody <laughs> in Canada at this point has commented on that video. Like it's pronounced Quebecois. And I'm like, yeah, I fucking get it now. <laughs> yeah, I've heard. I, yeah. I can't speak French. <laughs> I can I can barely speak English. I mean, to be like... fair, like both of those are also true of Quebecois people. <laughs> and like how would you necessarily know that? Like is that a is that No, I've only ever seen it written. Is that like down. A, a a general knowledge kind of thing? Because like I know about Quebecois being in Maine because I'm so well, close to Canada, but like is that a thing that everybody yeah, it's, else? It is one of those words too? that I like, think most people would you just know don't even ever see written. Yeah, down. There you go. <laughs> so like but I can see because like Yeah. <laughs> I can see why you would think that. But then also it's like Quebec and then you just add I just went swa. The end. But at least you have the like wa part. <laughs> and you weren't like Quebec the boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throughout the nineteen twenties, Coco would have affairs with celebrities like Igor Stravinsky, Edward Prince of <laughs> Wales, the future Edward the Eighth, Pierre Rivardi. And Hugh Richard Arthur Grosvenor, oh the Duke of Win- Westminster, who would end up being her lover for 10 years. She's doing good. She's doing fucking great. I mean, there's <laughs> there's whole, like, operas and ballets written just about her love affair with Igor Stravinsky alone. Like... Oh, promise me when I die. <sighs> yeah. When you do the episode on me, that you will talk about every single person I fucked. That that like that like I'll try. Of course. Well, we gotta pat out the run I mean, time. <laughs> yes. It's like okay, maybe not every person I fucked, but at least like the 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 lover. Oh yeah, like the good one. The yeah, because like we're never the gonna lover. be able to to go back through all those those drunken drunken grinder nights. <laughs> <laughs> Your your own Wikipedia page would be pretty long. Yeah. No, no. Well, we'll we'll, we'll cover all the important Thank ones. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the Wikipedia page would have a lot of citations needed. <laughs> it's like just like it's like grainy grinder screenshots. <laughs> <laughs> Most of these, there is just it's just a, and a bunch of people that don't have actual names. Just like that guy with the bridge that one time. <laughs> like, oh no, my phone for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like bubble butt no English. <laughs> <laughs> bubble butt no English. <laughs> That's what oh my God, guy who like did not speak a single word of English, and I was like, I don't even know your name, and I don't care to ask. But he had so a bubble we'll just, butt. He did. Coco met the Duke of Westminster, who was nicknamed Bender. Bender is such a rich people nickname. It is. At a party aboard his yacht in Monte Carlo. <laughs> <laughs> also a rich people thing. <laughs> See, it's funny because my my brain immediately went to Bender from Futurama, so I was imagining more like a white trash person. <laughs> I went the complete different. I was picturing like a lacrosse rapist. Yeah, a very lacrosse <laughs> like, rapist vibe. Like, yeah, like a very well off, yeah, well off white dude from like a rich family who has a nickname like Bender or like Duke or Chet mm-hmm. or something. Trip. Like, <laughs> <laughs> trip, yes, trip. Fucking trip. Allegedly, Bender had paid his childhood friend Vera Bate, a friend of Coco's, to convince Chanel to come to his party. So, like, <laughs> Bender was like already like he's so thirsty, such a fanboy. Yes. Yeah, he was like, please, please tell your friend to come to my party. I'll give you money. <laughs> That's so sad. Can you please? Um, I just want to. She just seems so cool. I just want me uh, This is very like I'm going to lose my virginity by prom vibes. <laughs> <laughs> this is the year, guys. <laughs> I'll give and Coco's gonna be my girlfriend. I bet you twenty dollars, twenty twenty olden time French dollars that you can't make Coco Chanel your girlfriend by the end of the night. <laughs> now it's starting to sound like a, a like a teenage romance movie, like you know, Ten Things I Hate About You, like Ala, like that time yes. period, of like early two thousands. <laughs> yeah, 
she's all that. Yeah, Very yeah. Very she's all that vibes. But these people are in their 40s on a yacht in Monte Carlo. Right. <laughs> and, and like on heroin. Yeah, exactly. On so much heroin. I can't even tell you. Like. Oh, my God. <laughs> And God knows what and else. And apparently, like, <laughs> apparently, like, Vera Bate, like, really had to convince Chanel. Chanel did not want to go. And it was actually Grand Duke Dimitri, her former lover turned friend, was the one who was like, are you seriously not going to go to this Christmas party? And she was like, oh, then there we go. <laughs> 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 so she was 40 years old at this point and still incredibly beautiful and youthful looking. She had a, she was witty with an acid tongue. She was just kind of a bad bitch. And I'm going to, I don't have a picture of her at 40, but I'm going to drop a picture of her at 37. So like basically the same thing. Yeah. Um, I would like to contest that 37 and 40 are basically the same thing, but. (laughs) (laughs) We won't look any different unless we have a really rough few years. We won't have, we won't look any different at 37 or 40. So that picture is her at 37. Um, And then. Oh, wow. This next picture is her. With her very good friend Winston Churchill <laughs> at age thirty eight. I love I love her her dark lip vibes. She's so cute. Like I love the heavy brow. She does a really good dark lip. She is really cute. Yeah. Mm. Yup. She's got the sultry stare down. Like she's got it down. <laughs> okay, now I can see how she was a man. She was boyish. Um, yeah. How she was masculinizing. Yeah. <laughs> she was like, I'm actually just going to outmask Winston fucking Churchill <laughs> on this little romp. The cuts are really nice on her clothes. Right? I love them. Winston Churchill was like so besotted with her. He would like write home to his wife about like how good she was at hunting and fishing and be like, oh, she's so charming. She was, was like, can you like- shut the fuck up about Coco Chanel? <laughs> <laughs> He was obsessed with this little tomboy. Like, great, Winston. Thank you so much. Like, (laughs) please write me next time you meet a sexy Nazi. (laughs) Mm. Chanel described Bender later on as a man of great generosity and courtesy, like many well-mannered Englishmen, at least until they land in France. The essence of refinement when ladies were present and when they were not. A gutter snipe and a cunning hunter. He had to be to hold me for ten years. Ten (laughs) years? uh, Ten years. They had a ten year relationship. Ten year bender. (laughs) Ten year bender. And like. Ten year bender with bender. (laughs) Ten year bender with bender. (laughs) I love that, like, she. In praising him, she was like, he had to be good in order to keep this hot bitch for 10 right. years. She's like, you can tell he was amazing because we were together for 10 years. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. He got all of this and that's pretty Look cool. at me. Look at I'm me and look, look at him. him. Like, look at me. Yeah. I'm not. <laughs> look at him. <laughs> you know he did well. <laughs> Coco's time in Catholic school had already molded her into quite the anti-Semite. In response to new fashion boutiques springing up in Paris, she once stated, I only feel Jews and Chinese, and the Jews more <gasps> than the Chinese. Just oh, explaining that. that my entire, like... <laughs> pretty, uh... pretty bad. Pretty fucking bad. I unhinged yeah. my jaw like a fucking Caitlin's jaw was on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is the, so I think this is around oh the time God. we start remembering why she's on this podcast, right? <laughs> why we don't like her. Yeah. Why we don't like her. Yeah. Hey, sickos and worms. It's uh, editing hoots here. Um, at this point, recording the episode, we all took a little break to freshen up our drinks. So I figured this would be a good point editing the episode to pivot to some ads. I'm going to read out one of the fake ads that one of our uh, Patreon patrons, this comes from patron sidekick, provided us. Uh, If you would like to provide a fake ad for us to read on Respect the Dead, head on over to patreon.com slash respect the dead and sign up to become one of our patrons. There's a number of tiers available and a couple of them allow you to provide us a fake sponsor ad to read out on the show. It has to be a real fake ad though. It can't be your MLM. 
Things going too well? Not gripped by unspecified terror? Then you should try anxiety. From the makers of depression and self-loathing comes anxiety. Anxiety is proven to make any situation just the worst. How does it work? Anxiety uses your brain to turn all the worrisome thoughts that people can dismiss and amplifies them until they become unbearable. That is not all. It can also make you worry about absolutely nothing, just a vague, terrible feeling of unease. Once you have anxiety, your life will never be the same. But don't take our word for it. Listen to our satisfied customers. I used to think when my friends left me on red, it was no big deal. Now I spend hours agonizing on what thing I did so that they now secretly hate me. Thanks, anxiety. When things start to get hectic at work, I would buckle down and try my best. Now with anxiety, instead, I just stare at a blank screen, paralyzed with feelings of helplessness and worthlessness. Try anxiety today with promo code was that the house settling or did someone break in for $5 off your first month. Anxiety, you'll be worried. Thanks again to Sidekick for uh, that submission on Patreon. And now, here's a here's a real ad. So okay, so so she was she was already that anti-Semitic uh, before Bender. But with Bender, who was <laughs> sorry, Mandy's face as uh, she's <laughs> trying to open her can, like while you're saying anti-Semitic. <laughs> I was trying to wait for a pause so that then it would be easier to edit out later. I'm sorry, <laughs> I was really trying to be gentle. <laughs> so okay, she was already that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> she was already that anti-Semitic before Bender, but with Bender, who was a notorious and outspoken anti-Semite. Her hatred of Jewish people grew and festered. She had been relatively disinterested in in politics until their meeting, but Bender instilled in her his own deep distrust of Bolshevism. Whenever he'd had a few too many brandies, and sometimes in front of a Rothschild, Bender would rant, I cannot bear those bloody Jews. <gasps> oh. <laughs> but they couldn't bear you either, honey. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, can you imagine being like a Rothschild, like just like sitting in the room with him while he's like, <laughs> you're like, it's like, mm, oh, no. do you, do just you, just hiding your face? Like, do we, <laughs> do you know who I am? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I've sat in a lot of rooms where people were just like, I don't know. I just think faggots are fucking disgusting. And I'm like, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm just like you. <laughs> I'm sure a few of the Rothschilds that he did that in front of probably did the same thing. They're probably like, yeah, uh huh. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh huh. Those Jews, those bloody All Jews. All the same here. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're worse. <laughs> Toads. <laughs> 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 Toads. Toads hate Jews, love lacrosse. <laughs> I hate juice love lacrosse. <laughs> right, Bender? That's not going to be one of our shirts. By the way. <laughs> no. no, 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 it's not. <laughs> there, uh, I'm not even 100% sure it's going to stay in the episode. <laughs> <laughs> and in a pretty fucking wild breach of etiquette, Bender also referred to the British royal family as those Jews falsely believing that Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, had Jewish heritage. Um, based on just like, I don't know, maybe he Feelings, read a tweet. Or vibes. Like... <laughs> yeah, some vibes. Vibes. Okay. He was just like, I don't know about those people. They must be Jews. The, the, I guess it's like the same vibe as like, I, this <laughs> yep. person is like obviously uh, like working to like control and destroy the world like must must be a jew mm. uh, you still see it like today right it's lizard people yeah. shit yeah yeah even though he was also like a nobleman like he was landed <laughs> 
<laughs> he was a duke. <sighs> Whatever. I'm, I'm trying to like make sense out of yeah. bigotry and, and you just can't. Um, there's no logic. Bender and Coco also reveled in their mutual homophobia. Oh. Yes, queen. Bender outed his own gay brother, ruining his marriage, life, and career. Wow. And Coco was quoted by her friend, author Paul Morand, as once saying, Homosexuals, are they not always hanging around women? My beauty, my little one, my angel constantly strangling them with flattery. I have seen young women ruined by these awful queers. <laughs> Drugs, divorce, and scandal. They will use any means to destroy a competitor and wreak vengeance on a woman. The queers want to be women, but they are lousy women. They are charming. <laughs> I... They are charming. I love that she's like, but I love those those F slurs. <laughs> she's like, they, okay, I just, love it. It, it. At the very, it has that like, um, it has that like uh, Trumpian speech vibe a little bit too, totally. where it's like the whole yeah, you know, Mexicans are totally the rapists, but sometimes good people too. <laughs> like right at the end, like no, see, I covered my bases. Right? It's fine. Uh, one of my favorite parts is she was like, "They will do anything to destroy a woman." I'm like, "Didn't you push a girl in a fire?" <laughs> I thought that too. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second. You like danced your enemy into fire, literally. But like, honestly, I kind is of she so wrong though? Because like, if she I, if she hadn't have been a Nazi, she definitely would have been a queer icon for doing that. Well, yes. This is this is what I'm saying about <laughs> like she's not necessarily wrong, and I bet the queers that like fawned all over her were were absolutely fucking annoying. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> oh my god baby you're so cute i love it like oh my god you're so iconic like <laughs> like they would be standing all over her yeah never giving mm -hmm. her the opportunity to breathe um <laughs> but then like even at i love that even at the end of it she's like they're fucking hilarious though <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I love that. They're great this to have like, around. <laughs> Always have a few queers at the party. This is one of the bad things about her that, like, I problematically stand like this quote because she's like, she's like, she goes on this awful homophobic tirade, and then she's like, but I love those those fucking f slurs. <laughs> yeah, hilarious. I'm sure the gays loved you. <laughs> and. I wrote in my notes that this is interesting because, like, several of Coco's close friends were openly gay I was men. just about to ask. She must have been friends with gay men. Like <laughs> She was probably sniping right at them. <laughs> like, she was subtweeting. <laughs> she wasn't talking about the queers. She was specifically talking about Jean Cocteau. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> uh, she, was, she was very close friends. Is Jean Cocteau? She was very close friends with... Uh, with yeah, playwright and director Jean Cocteau, okay. and with uh, Sergei Diaghilev, uh, the founder of the Ballet Russes. Uh, she dropped absolutely everything. She was like on a yacht when she found out that Diaghilev was on his uh, deathbed with Mizia. Uh, Mizia was with her, and they both dropped everything and rushed to be at his bedside uh, while they was dying in 1929. Um, and she, for Jean Cocteau and his partner Jean Marais during the war, um, she paid their apartments and all of their expenses she like paid their way like she had several close friends that were openly gay and she knew it um in fact there was um in sleeping with the enemy the hal von biography uh he said that like during the war while she was like paying for jean cocteau's apartments newspapers like started a rumor that she was getting ready to um announce an engagement to jean cocteau which jean cocteau thought was like very funny because like he and his <laughs> boyfriend were open yeah. like yeah. just walking around just walking around um, and <laughs> she did not find it that funny <laughs> just walking around which is fun like because um jean cocteau also like um, I don't think he was like full on collaborating with the Nazis, but he was like very friendly to the Vichy government um, and being openly gay and like German officers were like leaving him alone because he was playing nice. OK, I so think... he was just like prancing around with his boyfriend. And it was like there's there's so many 
there, like basically anybody who is rich or famous during the Second World War, you should be suspect of. Oh yeah, right. they all were like, "Well, if I play nice with the Nazis, they'll let me do what I want to do," including being openly gay. <laughs> <laughs> do we? Okay, her homophobia. Do we have like other quotes about that, or is it possible that she was just like ragging on her friends and like we're from like we're looking back on it? It could be that. Her friends would be, like, I mean, a lot of her friends talking about her after the fact would say she was prone to, like, rants like that about the gays. But it really could oh, just okay, be okay. about, it really could just be about her friends. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like she's describing rich white gays. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, mm. high on coke at, like, a white party or something. She literally said drugs, divorce, and scandal. And she's like, oh my god, you're so skinny you're so pretty <laughs> like, oh my god is there ever told you? you're so pretty i can say that because i'm gay <laughs> and she's like i feel strangled by this flattery <laughs> fuck off <laughs> well she was probably like if you're not Jean. gonna fuck me shut your mouth <laughs> Like, she was so horny. She was probably <laughs> pissed that, like, Jean Marai was, like, a very sexy actor. So she's probably pissed that her bestie was, like, no, fucking like, this sexy actor that she couldn't fuck. <laughs> I read that quote to myself, like, 400 times because it made me laugh so much. <laughs> the they are charming is just, like, it's it's the button. It's so funny. <laughs> I for like a split second, I was like, "Did I hear that wrong?" And I was like, "No, Kalen. Yeah, you know what this they is. Show me. I love them so much. <laughs> you can't live without them. It's like I love them. <laughs> yeah, I love these filthy degenerates. <laughs> <laughs> they're like literally the worst. Whenever they're around me, I like fucking can't breathe. The love of my life, <sighs> literally. So cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Absolutely a white woman to drop a whole bunch of slurs. <laughs> so another reason this is interesting is because one of her other biographers, Lisa Cheney, claimed in Coco Chanel in Intimate Life that Coco was bisexual and also it had some affairs with women. <laughs> so yeah. it just like doesn't count if she's not doing it. Right. Just <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, that also sounds like something a queer woman would say about yeah. gay men. <laughs> I, it's making me feel like your theory, you're onto yeah, something. Like, she might have just been, like, subtweeting her friends. <laughs> like, gay on gay violence. <laughs> Whereas Bender was probably, I mean, Bender was clearly obviously homophobic because yeah. he outed his brother, like, just to be an asshole. Uh, so she was probably like, oh, my boyfriend is homophobic. This gives me a chance to say awful things about my gay friends. <laughs> I mean, that is very, that is something a lot of, of girls have done, I've seen, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> over the course of of being that, that horrible gay friend <laughs> that you hate and love. Um, the amount of times they were like, okay, so, so what if my boyfriend thinks you're fucking disgusting and doesn't want you sitting near us at the movie theater? <laughs> like, but I love him. <laughs> While Coco was living with Bender in England, she continued to entertain members of the British aristocracy and political elite, including Churchill, who was quite taken with her abilities as a sportswoman, as I said. But she forced everyone in their company to speak French despite learning English, which I also stand. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, oh, no, you speak French around me. I, that that is a pretty. Uh, <laughs> it's the most French thing I've ever heard. I like that. That that, that is a what an icon. Move. Oh, I shouldn't say that. I'm so problematic. <laughs> she stayed committed to her career and uh, design while she was in England, much to Bender's frustration. To quote a friend, Lady Ia Abdi, she really had two loves, herself and her fashion house. Everything else was merely passion, weakness, adventures without a future, calculated liaisons. Also just like such an iconic quote. Uh, Bender was real pissed about that, though. He did not want her to continue mm. designing. Uh, it is unlikely that Bender, a duke, ever actually planned to marry Coco, but he frequently tried to convince her to give up her business and become a full-time partner, which she repeatedly refused. To prove her independence, Coco returned Bender's unused checkbook. 
When Bendor invited a young Viennese princess to come fishing with him, Coco reacted by going to hang out with one of her former lovers in Paris, throwing Bendor into a jealous rage. <laughs> I love her. Oh, I hate good, her, but yeah. I love her. <sighs> Honestly, that girl is like very lucky that she didn't get like drowned in a lake. <laughs> like, she got away with so much. She got away with her, just like just. She fucked around and she never found out. I, I was definitely she expecting like, for a second another uh, incident with a fire in a dress. <laughs> like Coco just showing up <laughs> with a chandelier. No, she played this coolly. She was okay. like, okay. And it was uh, it was Pierre Reverdy. It was the poet Pierre oh, Reverdy. She was like, okay, I'm just going to go hang out with Reverdy for a few days. Mm -hmm. See you later. And uh, he was furious. He, mm -hmm. he, threw, he flew into a, a jealous rage. He bombarded her apartment with letters saying, Chanel is crazy, which is hilarious. Chanel replied, All I want from you are wild flowers picked from your own hands. And he sent her flowers, and under the leaves of those flowers were hidden precious jewels. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bender had also purchased Coco a plot of land in southern France, on which she built a villa called La Posa. Coco and Bendor officially split in 1929. According to one possibly apocryphal tale, they got into a bitter argument aboard his yacht, after which he left and retrieved an enormous emerald and placed it in the palm of her hand. Without losing a beat, Coco Chanel dropped the emerald into the ocean. <laughs> oh! I was waiting for that. I was like, there's going to be like a little croissant. She did the little rose thing from uh, Titanic. Just, ah, just drew yeah. her in. Ah. Rose but petty. Yeah. Rose, rose but, but petty. petty. He like got into a fight with her and was like, here, take this. And she was like, no. whoops, bye. She threw it into the ocean like Rose threw Jack into the ocean. <laughs> like, like, oh, I'll never man. forget you. Bye. <laughs> I'll never forget you. Bye forever. <laughs> Peace. Speaking of bye forever, uh, I think this is where we're going to end part one. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. I don't have to wait. I know. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, we, we get to hear it. <laughs> You're going to hear it in I'm like so upset. 15 like minutes. A good two seconds. <laughs> For everyone else, you do have to wait, but not a full week, just two days. So this is a Monday. We're releasing on a Monday. Uh, part two will be out this Wednesday on your favorite podcasting app. We're sorry for the Coco Teas. <laughs> Coco Teas. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess this is our, our probably our first released two-parter so that's exciting it is exciting oh yeah it is it is exciting and uh okay all right so bye yeah bye-bye yeah. <laughs> bye. thank you so much for listening to this episode of respect the dead you can follow respect the dead on instagram and twitter at underscore respect the dead if you want to follow us individually, you can find our socials in the show notes. And you should check out our YouTube channels. We don't shit on dead people there as often, but still, we're making tons of cool stuff. If you enjoyed Respect the Dead and would like to support us, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can give us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you found us. If you leave us a review, we can read it out on the podcast. Reviews are the best way for new listeners to discover the show. Give us at least five stars and then share us with a good friend who likes venting about dead people. You can also give us some money over on our Patreon. Patreon supporters get some cool bonus content like bloopers from the cutting room floor and even coming up with a fake sponsor ad that we'll read in an episode. It has to be a fake business though, not your MLM, honey. Thanks so much for listening. Join us every Monday for our next Worm Feast. I'm Kellen Conrad. I'm Aileen Mandy. And I'm Hoots. Bye. 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 Bye.